Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. Today we're going to start a new study on Psalms 37 since it's so relevant to where we are living right now. So Alton, where would you like to start this morning? Well, I'd like to start by saying I love the Word of God. There's not one word that I just don't hold on to like it's a piece of gold. But if somebody had to force me to say what's my favorite thing in the whole Bible, I'd have to say Psalm 37. Because whatever trouble you find yourself in or whatever tribulation you find yourself in, you'll find the answer for it in Psalm 37. It's almost like a catch-all band-aid for you that will help you to get your mind straight about what's going on and what's happening and the solutions. And so I just love reading it. It's, it's a, uh, if, if you're all stressed out and everything, you might call it a biblical chill pill. <laughs> and so it will always settle you. The Word of God should settle you. Okay? And so <clears throat> in this day and age, there's a lot of things coming out against us that we know are wrong. We feel sometimes we don't have any recourse or any way of changing it. But God is on the move. But you have to know that. You have to believe it, not just say it. And so it starts out by saying, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Okay? So, when you think about that, it's very easy for us to fret and worry and wring our hands and bite our fingernails and whatever else you do to get over it. But those things are just temporary, okay? You need the Word of God to help you set you straight. All these other things we might do, you might smoke, you might do drugs, you might do alcohol, or any other thing you can think of to get you your mind off it. Escapism, we might call it, but you don't escape it. When you crawl out of that bottle in the morning with the hangover, your problem is still there. It's not resolved. The Word of God will resolve it. It's not a crutch. It's the answer. And once we realize that, then we will get rid of all these band-aids and go to the healing cure that he's died on the cross for us to have. It's not just for our boo-boos, it's for our mental health, it's for all kind of things that he wants us to be at rest and at peace and have joy and all those get, um, fruits of the Spirit. Okay. So, <clears throat> this word fret, the word kara, it, it means when you get hot, you get mad, you get upset, okay? Uh, you blaze up. It talks about ze zealous, okay? Um, you can be zealous for a good thing, you can be zealous for a bad thing. Sometimes we get worked up and we go, wow, they ought to just take that guy out and shoot him or something. <laughs> you know, he doesn't want us to get to that, to that point. And um, there's, there's a whole bunch of words that that means. You know, be incensed, kindle, uh, be wroth. And, and so he doesn't want us to get worked up like that. That does not help you. For one thing, it will decrease the effectiveness of your immune system. You 
we all know some people that are so burned up with hatred about somebody that they end up sick. Uh, you can get rheumatoid arthritis and things like that because your immune system is all jacked up and it does not help you. Fear will do the same thing. It will affect your immune system. A lot of people are worrying about COVID. The fear of it is helps the COVID overcome your immune system. So quit fearing, quit fretting. God's in control. I don't care what it looks like to you. God's in control. As long as Peter kept his eye on Jesus, he walked on water. Everybody says, oh, Jesus was the only one that ever walked on water. Excuse me, Peter did too. And you and I can. We can walk above our troubles if we keep our eye on Jesus, not on the circumstances. As soon as Peter saw the water boiling around and waves, he said, I'm not supposed to be able to do this. And then he sank. Oh. Then what did he do? He called upon the name of Jesus, right? I think about Adam and Eve. The Lord told them, if you eat from this tree, you're going to die. Well, they ate, and they didn't keel over because we think death is the body dying. They cut themselves off from their source of life, which was God, okay? And so when you do that, you become deficient in a lot of things because those things that keep you alive you are now deficient in them. And God wants, wanted to reestablish all this. But man had to die. <laughs> it was the decree. We talked about that in the last session. A man had to die. So by one man, sin came in the world. By one man, it was taken out. And so when he died on the cross, he was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, the sacrifice, the death. So a man had to die. And so he said, I'll be the man. And he did. And so <clears throat> we don't need to fret. We don't need to try to work our weasel out of this thing or work our our own salvation up without him. Okay? A lot of people take the prodigal son, for instance, all the way back. He's saying what he was going to say and how he was going to reconcile himself to his father. And he had his whole plan of salvation figured out in his head. When he got home, he found out none of that mattered to his dad. He reestablished them, gave him his robe, gave him his sandals, gave him his ring, killed the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. My son came home. He was dead. Now he's alive. <laughs> okay? So God has a different idea than we do. And you're not going to come up with your own salvation. He's already got the plan. What needs to be done? We don't know what needs to be done. He does. Okay? So, no need to worry. Quit, bite. Quit biting your fingernails. And then it says, don't be envious. Okay? Don't be jealous of what they're doing or what they're getting away with, seemingly. Okay? Uh, Sometimes we, we do get that way. Uh, in Psalm 73, I believe, David, Asaph may have wrote that one. He said, uh, you know, I looked at what the other people were. They're, they're getting fat. They're get, they, they get everything. They seem to not have any problems. And me, I'm trying to do the right thing, and I'm thinking I must have washed my hands in vain. 
But then I watched and I saw that I, I didn't understand. I was mad until I went into the sanctuary and got with God and found out that, hey, I'm the one that has it made. They're the ones that can't sleep at night. They're worrying about their money. They're worrying about the schemes that they pulled backfiring on them <laughs> and, and making enemies and everything like that. And so it says, don't be envious. Don't be jealous. Don't be provoked that they're getting away with something. You know, the, the prodigal son went out and, and blew his inheritance. But you know, his brother had to be jealous that he was getting away with something. Because when he came back, he never did get the heart of the father. He was mad at his brother. A lot of people sit in church all their life and never get the heart of the Father. And when prodigals start coming back, they got a problem with it. It sticks in their craw that they've got to go out and kick up their heels, and I didn't. Well, that's what this is talking about. Don't get upset because you think they're getting to do something that you wish you could. <laughs> okay? It says, don't be envious, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Okay? Funny, that word, or cut down. It means to be clipped. It also means to be circumcised. So when you think about it, you see somebody being evil, right off the bat, you wish that the law would come down on them and swoop down and they'd get their just desserts. Well, what about, to me, the best way you can get revenge on somebody is to get them saved. You win the argument, so to speak. It's not really your argument, but you feel like vindicated if they come over to your side or to God's side, however you want to look at it. And what did you have to do to become an Israelite? Get circumcised and come under the law at the time. Now you get baptized in his name for remission of sins. And Colossians 2 will tell you when you're buried with him in baptism, then you come into a place of circumcision. That's what the modern circumcision is, baptism in his name. And you get to have the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the sins of the flesh. And so when you think about it, why, if they get cut down, if they get saved, then they're off your list of things you got to fret about. <laughs> okay. It's amazing that these different things we talked to in the last time about think, sin that so easily besets us. God wants to circumcise that off of our life. Okay? And so a lot of people don't like talking about circumcision, but it's there and you have to deal with it. <laughs> and, and what does it mean? Um, cutting off that which is not needed. Anything in my life that is going to slow me down from becoming like Jesus, going to take away from my goal, okay, of becoming like Jesus. Jesus was the express image of the Father. And what are we to be? The express image of Jesus. The word express image is the Greek word character, which we get our word character from. Okay, so we're going to be the character. If you ask anything in my name, in my character, it'll be given to you. Okay, 
a lot of times we don't ask. We, we just say his name, but we're not asking in his character. If I abide in you and you abide in me, you may ask what you will. That implies that word character means he took a piece of metal and etched characters on it, etched an impression of who he is on, on you and I. So if that's not happening, too many times we ask and we just say his name like it's an abracadabra word. I, I am thinking about Adam. You know, he knew if he ate off the tree, he'd die. And he ate off the tree and he, and he was cut off from God spiritually. And he knew all the different curses that came on him because of it. Uh, ground wasn't going to yield its strength to him. It was going to end up with weeds. That's why Jesus put a crown of thorns and took that with him when he died. That was one of the curses. But all this was like theory. It was all there. But when Cain killed Abel, the reality of something showed up. This is your nature, Adam, that you chose. And now Cain killed Abel. And the lineage could have died right there, going to Jesus. But they started a new one with Seth. His name means appointed because he said, God's appointed me another man. And nowadays, you know, murders are on the news. Five or six of the first stories have to do with somebody dying in your area. But you can imagine that the very first one had to really be a, a humdinger as far as how it affected him emotionally. And so when Seth had his son, he named him Enos, which is Enosh. In Hebrew means frail mortal man. He came to a conclusion that, hey, I need God. I'm a frail mortal man. I'm just here. I could be dead in, in the next minute. And so he, uh, he named Enosh, frail mortal man. It says, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Once we realize our frailties, then we come to our senses and we call upon the name of the Lord and start heading back to our daddy. And so, at this time, I'd like to have my lovely wife speak to you about goes on after this because God has his own brand of logic. If P then Q, if you do these things, I will do these things for you. But I need you to do these be, to set you up so I can do these other things for you. Would you like to go on with that? Sure, sure. <clears throat> Verse 3 of chapter 37 in Psalms simply is stated this way in the King James Version. It says, Trust in the Lord, dwell, and you'll dwell in the land, and surely you will be fed. But when you look in the Amplified, it has an even more um, profound, I believe, understanding that's, that's taught there. That verse ends by saying, And feed on the faithfulness of God. You will be fed, King James says, Amplified says, And feed on the faithfulness of God. So you see the difference between the two versions. One is passive, you will be fed. But the active version in the Amplified says, feed on the faithfulness of God. In other words, we have the responsibility of reminding ourselves of the faithfulness of God. Trust in the Lord, that verse starts out. And it ends by saying, and feed on the faithfulness of God. And so in these days that are so perilous and so there's so much upheaval going on around us, we have the ability to remind ourselves of the faithfulness of God. 
Think back to the times that God's been faithful in your life, the things he's brought you through. And you can add to that testimonies of other people that have experienced the faithfulness of God. You can look at stories in the Bible. It would, it would take forever to recount all the stories in the Bible of when God was faithful in a person's life and he brought them through in seemingly impossible circumstances. So it is active. It is up to us to remind ourselves and to look in the word for examples of the faithfulness of God in human circumstances. And if we move on to verse 4 of Psalms 37, it starts out, Delight also in the Lord. Delight also. Delight yourself in the Lord. The word delight, there's so much meaning to unpack there. It doesn't just mean be happy. But the Hebrew word delight, as translated, literally means this. It means to be soft or pliable. See how one definition changes the whole concept. We are to delight ourselves in the Lord, but the key also is can we be pliable or soft? Think about clay in the hands of a sculptor. Can we be soft clay in the hands of the sculptor who is our Heavenly Father? And if we allow him to mold us and shape us and bend us and stretch us, then that can cause delight because we see the product that he is able to produce is a beautiful, wonderful thing. So the rest of the verse, verse 4, holds also this reward. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So if we can be pliable in his hands, then he can give us the desires of our heart because they're going to be in line with what he's trying to achieve. But notice this word. The key here is to know that we're pliable, but also notice this word, uh, the, the give, to give. The word give here has a lot of applications in the Hebrew language. It includes such things as to put, to make, add, apply, appoint, assign, bestow, bring forth, and cause. And so if you put those definitions in where the word give is, notice what it says. And he will put, he will apply, he will make, he will assign. Those words give us so much more meaning. He will assign the desires of your heart. He will put in your heart, the desires. So again, this adds so much more meaning to just one verse that looks on the onset to be so simple. If we allow ourselves to be pliable in his hands, then he can put in us the desires and make them the desires of our heart because they're in keeping with his purpose and his direction. So think about that concept in verse 5 says this, it says, if we commit our way, the word way, other words that are in the definition are road, course of life, and journey. So if we commit our journey or our course of life to the Lord, trust also in him. We, we've talked about the word trust, and in this application, it's, there's a surprising definition it goes along with the concept of trusting. It means to literally to run for refuge. When you think of someone running for refuge, you normally think, oh, they're weak, they're vulnerable, they're fearful. But if we trust in God, if we trust in him, we know he is our refuge. And we go to him boldly and knowing that his courage, his strength, his refuge is there for us. And so again, trust also in him. Run for refuge to him. So it means to boldly run. And then the end of that verse says, he will bring it to pass. He will bring it to pass. One word of that definition is to finish. It is to finish. So what a powerful thought. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. 
Philippians 1, 6 says, He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So his faithfulness, our ability to turn and run to his refuge for his strength, his courage, his answer, being pliable in his hands and allowing him to apply, to make, to put in our hearts the desires that he wants there. It all fits into a beautiful word picture and a message in and of itself. So we can be confident of this, Philippians 1, 6 says, that he who has begun a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. So instead of fretting and, and worrying, we can instead encourage ourselves in the Lord, feed on his faithfulness. And then I want to also pull in 1 Peter 1, 8. And picking up in the middle of that verse, it says, Whom, having not seen you love, it's talking about Jesus, the previous verse 7 says, Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, not yet seeing but believing in him, you exalt with unspeakable joy. And joy and delight, we think, go hand in hand. When we think of those two words. Having been glorified, obtaining the end of your faith. And that word end is a big word. It may be a short word, but it's full of meaning. It means the completion, the point aimed at, the goal. Receiving the goal of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. He strengthens us. He strengthens our soul when we run to him because we know he's our refuge. And we draw from his strength. The strength not sourced in us, but sourced in him. He is able to shape us as we allow him to do that. And then verse 6 is the payoff of Psalms 37 up to this point. Having done verses 3, 4, and 5, verse 6 says this, And he, if you do these things in the previous verses, and he shall bring forth your righteousness like the light and your judgment like the noonday. He'll bring forth the pursuit of his righteousness and he'll cause it to shine forth like light those around us can see, and your judgment will be like the noonday. There won't be clouded judgment, in other words. There'll be full, bright judgment that is, is very obvious for us to see and to follow. So that's what I have to share concerning Psalms 37. We'll pick up next time and look at more of these powerful verses in this chapter. But until then, God bless you. Thank you for spending some time with us, and we will see you again soon.